All right, great. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Um, so now that you guys have finished your paper, you can totally relax and enjoy this great lecture and be totally focused. I know nobody's tired and nobody's, nobody's burnt out from staying up all night working on your paper because you guys totally planned it out ahead of time and it was great time management skills. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, uh, Dr. Samantha David, Davis just finished her PhD at UCSB and undergrad at UCSB too? Yes. Yeah, undergrad at UCSB too. And um, so she's going to tell us um, a bit about her work, so I'll let her tell it in more detail. But um, we uh, are really lucky to have her take the day off of her busy schedule right before Thanksgiving and come up and talk to us. Um, so I know Dr. Steele has talked a bit about coral reef ecosystems, but they're really, really cool systems, really, really important experimental systems also from the history of conservation and history of ecology, both in sort of theory and biodiversity and all that kind of good stuff, but also in terms of trying new management approaches and understanding drivers of degradation and how we can combat those things. So, so with that, uh, Dr. Samantha Davis. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for coming today. I just heard that you guys have a bunch of papers due and stuff today, <laughs> so I really appreciate you guys coming. I totally was thinking like, okay, preparing myself for lecturing to three people, so I'm really glad <laughs> to see you guys more people here. Um, thank you. So the introduction was pretty, was spot on. I did my undergraduate at UCSB um, with Dr. Russ Schmidt and Sally Holbrook, who also worked with Claire. Um, I think they were your advisors too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we go way back. So we're like we're in the same. Team. Yeah, we're the same family. We're like yeah. grandchild and child or something. I don't know how that works, but something <laughs> how like they that. Do that. Something, something like that. Um, but yeah, I worked with uh, Russ and Sally, uh, Professor Holbrook and Schmidt, and they uh, we worked in Maria French Polynesia. So um, most of the work that they've been doing for the past twenty years has been in uh, coral reef ecosystems. They're really cool <coughs> ecosystems to study because um, they're really they're relatively accessible and they're they have a lot of interesting phenomena going on and so specifically uh, we've been thinking about um, the effects of disturbance on different um, communities and coral reefs and so my work has really focused on understanding um, how these ecosystems respond to disturbance um, specifically how uh, the process of recovery of coral reefs occurs and what kinds of processes are involved in um, controlling that recovery process. So today I'm going to talk about my dissertation research, um, which was focused on um, understanding the mechanisms underlying macroalgal phase shifts on coral reefs. And I know that you guys have had some lectures on coral reefs so far, um, but I really encourage you to stop me, raise your hand, and ask a question at any point during this. It doesn't have to be a straight lecture. You can feel free to just raise your hand and we can go into something a little more detail, um, whatever you like. <coughs> so before I get too far, um, I just wanted to give you guys a couple examples of phase shifts and let you know what I'm talking about when I'm referring to phase shifts throughout this talk. Um, phase shifts are uh, large and often abrupt, um, but the key thing is persistent shifts in the structure and function of an ecosystem. So, um, one example that's very uh, characteristic is a kelp forest ecosystem shift. So on the bottom here we have a kelp forest that's dominated by um, uh, lots of kelp including Macrocystis pyrica. Um, and <laughs> Rocking out. Yeah, that's pretty nice. cool. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, so kelp forests house a wide variety of biodiverse organisms, so lots of fish species, lots of invertebrates, uh, many of which are used as part of local fisheries and so provide economic value to their regions. Um, through some shifts, some different changes, they can go from being dominated by uh, kelps to dominated by urchins, which is called an urchin barren. Um, those changed reefs, those have a different structure and function, they support uh, very different and much lower levels of biodiversity, and this can have um, economic consequences for those uh, fisheries that I mentioned. Another um, example is the uh, example of savanna ecosystems. So in these systems, you can, tra you can have a shift from a grassy dominated savanna to a shrubby woodland dominated savanna. And these have different um, types of species that are associated with each of these conditions. And this can have important um, bio consequences for biodiversity, um, but as well uh, tourism, because a lot of these regions in, for example, Africa, 
uh, rely heavily on ecotourism and people come out to see big game that you find in the grassy savannas and so these shifts to um, shrubby woodlands can have economic consequences if there's less um, tourism in these areas. And today I'm going to spend most of the time, all the time, talking about coral reef phase shifts. So um, the most commonly understood phase shifts um, or commonly studied phase shifts is one from a healthy coral reef, reef on the left, uh, dominated by living coral, which you guys know is um, provides habitat, provides structure for the reef, provides food. Um, it's, it's a key ecosystem engineer in this in this system. Hosts a wide uh, level or high level of biodiversity. Um, it can shift from being dominated by healthy living coral to being dominated by macroalgae. And macroalgae, you know, in kelp forests is a really good thing. Uh, macroalgae on coral reefs is not so good. It doesn't have as much uh, biodiversity. It doesn't have the same um, ecosystem provisions as coral. Um, we know that once macroalgae settle on the reef, it can make it really difficult for uh, corals to settle. They take up the space. They can overgrow them. So once you get to macroalgae, um, coral recovery is, is somewhat inhibited. And this is already known in the literature. So for my dissertation research, um, the whole point of the dissertation is to kind of figure out where the knowledge is, um, the point that the knowledge has reached, and then find a way to advance it. So there's really two outstanding questions in this study of phase shifts or coral reefs. Um, and it's really about whether there are feedbacks that can maintain um, a particular phase or state um, on the reef. So what feedbacks maintain a coral state versus what feedbacks maintain in a macroalgal state. And then how reversible are these phase shifts? So as I mentioned, they can be uh, persistent transitions. And so the, the key question that comes from that is whether once you have a transition, can you reverse it? Can you go back? Um, and this, these, both of these questions are really underlying the, the idea of ecosystem resilience, which you guys may know um, has, has two parts. It's really about the resistance to disturbance, so how well can um, a system persist in face of different types of disturbance or perturbations, and then um, the recovery, so that idea of reversibility. So if you have a recovery back to a coral state, how uh, feasible is this? And it's really important to understand um, the phase shifts on coral reefs because we'd like to better predict and manage um, these phase shifts because we'd like to know how to promote the desired state. So generally, we want to see a healthy coral state so that we can have high biodiversity of fish. We can have, um, they also provide, um, uh, what's it called? They, they protect islands from um, storms and waves. So there's lots of uh, benefits to having a healthy coral reef and we'd like to figure out how to promote those. Um, and we want to preserve the critical ecosystem services, as I mentioned, that are social, economic, as well as ecological. Okay, so this is gonna be, I'm gonna do a, a walkthrough <coughs> of how I'm thinking about a phase shift, how it can occur on coral reefs. So, <coughs> Starting out on the left with a healthy coral reef, um, some sort of disturbance can occur. So it, it can be um, a storm that kills some coral. It can be an outbreak of a um, coral predator, so like a crown of thorn sea star that consumes coral polyps. It can be a bleaching event, uh, the temperatures rise, or it can be a disease, any of those things that kills the coral. Um, once that happens, you can transition to a sort of temporary uh, state where the coral's dead, and now it's hard to tell on this image, but you can see that there's not, there's not really color left, and what happens at that point is that substrate that was once living coral is now open for settlement, and the first thing to settle is turf algae, so it's like a really fast growing, you can think of it as a, a weed or something like that, it grows, it settles on almost any substrate that's not living. Um, on the coral reef, so it's going to grow quickly. And so once you have that, question? Oh. Once you have that turf grow, um, if you have um, if you have the right processes um, and the right conditions, you can have coral recover from that state. So um, this this turf algae that is covering the substrate does not impede the settlement of new coral um, or the growth of coral. So you can have coral end up recovering, and at that point you can um, have a recovery from your original disturbance. And we know that there's key processes involved in maintaining this coral 
um, state these stabilizing processes. And those I'm going to be talking about a lot today are feedbacks, so positive feedbacks um, that can reinforce a given state. So back to the center one, if you don't have those positive feedbacks or the feedbacks that promote coral, you can transition to from the turf to being dominated by macroalgae. So um, if the coral, for example, are unable to recruit, there's no coral settlers, um, so there's no potential for coral to come back, um, and there is a lot of macroalgae, that's one example, you can have a transition to the reef being dominated by macroalgae. And so we know that um, these transitions from uh, degraded coral reefs to macroalgae do happen, but one of the key gaps in the um, understanding is understanding what processes enable these transitions between the states. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Which state would you say the Great Barrier Reef is in? Because I know a lot of people are saying that it's like, it's going on past the point of return, so is it still at that middle stage where it has some really transition to one of those two at the end, or is it going towards more at the bottom? Yeah, system. that's a great question. Um, that's kind of a, it's a difficult question to unpack because the Great Barrier Reef is huge, and so there's actually probably a lot of patchiness as far as what's going on. So some parts of the Great Barrier Reef are actually, the coral's doing quite well. In other areas, you have a lot of macroalgae. And so it's not, it's hard to say whether the whole reef is in one phase or another. Okay. Um, it's probably <coughs> a combination. And the key thing is um, understanding how to on how to predict what might happen and how to recognize signs that you could be heading towards a degraded reef. So that's a great segue into what I was looking at uh, for my dissertation is this kind of gap in the literature, which is um, what processes are involved in stabilizing a macroalgal state once it's established, mm -hmm. as well as what are the processes involved in the transitions between um, between the states. <coughs> so I did my work in Morea, French Polynesia, as I mentioned, um, and all the work that I did was in the lagoon, so that's the greenish area, the shallow reefs. Um, there's also coral on this barrier um, on the crest around the island, and there's also coral um, on the off, off shore of the island, so the four reef. But all of my research and all the stuff I'll be talking about today concerns um, within the lagoon, so within that light green area. Um, again, Morea, this is an aerial shot of Morea, um, which is located next to Tahiti, that's the island behind it. So this is in the South Pacific. Um, and Morea is a really um, interesting place to work because it's been a highly disturbed system and we have a lot of data um, looking at the effects of the disturbance over time. So these are data from a 2009 paper uh, from the French researchers who were following a particular uh, transect in the reef for, they've been following it since at least the 90s, but probably earlier than that. And um, I'm showing you this figure to <coughs> demonstrate that we have records of um, multiple different types of disturbances. So we've got cyclones and we've got bleaching events. Um, and you see coral, turf, and macroalgae on this graph. And the, um, what you can see is even though there's been multiple disturbances, the coral decline, it's the blue line, and, but it still has been able to increase, at least to 2006. So you can see that there is multiple types of disturbances, but there still appears to be recovery of the coral. And that really makes us think that this might be a really resilient system. Um, and so it, might, it would be an interesting system to study what are these processes involved that enable the coral to return even after multiple disturbances. Um, so this, that project kind of ended at 2006, and that's about the time that I started getting involved in this research. Um, I went down there as an undergrad in 2007 and helped with a graduate student doing research. And during that time, um, we started to see a new disturbance. So this is um, over here on the left. Uh, between 2006 and 2009, there was an outbreak of the crown of thorn sea star, which is a coral predator, a voracious coral predator. You can see it's sitting on top of the coral there, and it's actually um, just sucking the polyps out of the coral. So once it would be done with that, it would basically be a just giant dead um, structure that could then be settled by a turf algae and then whatever else. So that was a disturbance that was happening island-wide. Um, and then also in 2010, there was a big cyclone that mainly affected the north um, offshore of the island. 
And so I'm just mentioning these two disturbances because it was for my, it was kind of in the time frame of my dissertation and allowed me to really think about, again, these questions of recovery, resistance and recovery. Um, so my research was made possible by um, being able to work as part of a long-term ecological research program. So I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that, but in, it's a US program, there's 26 sites um, around the country, as well as in Antarctica, um, Arctic, and Marea. So there's a tropical uh, research component as well as Arctic and Antarctic sites. Um, and the main goals of the LTR program are to provide long-term um, data sets to be able to examine and look for these long-term trends. So understanding that when disturbances happen, recovery processes take you know, generally longer than a typical grant, which is two, two to five years. So um, these long-term ecological programs exist in kind of charismatic systems so that you can, we can study um, the longer-term processes. So um, it's a really cool program if you guys wanted to check it out. But the main um, thing I want to point out here is kind of the goals of the program. And specifically, um, step five is the patterns and consequences of the disturbance that arise from um, or induce long-term trends. And so that really fits into what my research uh, for my dissertation was uh, geared towards. And so a dissertation is hopefully not longer than like six or seven years. Um, <laughs> hopefully. So hopefully <laughs> it's not longer than that. So it's really hard to look for, uh, to look at things that happen over a longer time scale than that. So it was really great for me to be able to look at the um, data from this long-term program, which I'll show you in a second, um, and really make use of that to kind of think about hypotheses that I wanted to test. Um, so the, the way that the sampling is set up around the island is they have six sites, six locations on the North Shore, East, and West Shores. And within those six sites, we have um, three zones that we do monitoring. There's the Coral Reef, which I mentioned was outside of the island, the coral that's kind of on the shallow end of before it drops off into you know, the deep. Uh, there's the reef crest, and then back reef is kind of that uh, within that lagoon habitat, and then a fringing reef is the reef right next to the island. So um, the LTER monitors in these three habitats, um, and they monitor the um, cover of the benthic substrate, so coral, um, algae, they do invertebrates, they look at the fish, and they also do um, oceanographic measurements, but I mainly use the uh, fish and benthic um, organisms for my work. Just to clarify, there's yeah. three zones in each of those locations, or? Yeah, so each of these at, at this site, so this is like site four. Um, within that, we have transects on the outer, the fore reef, within the uh, back reef at the lagoon, and then also on the frigid reef. So it's a lot of data collection, uh, which is the cool thing about this is that you can actually ask a lot of different questions because you have multiple sites around the island and you have that coverage of different types of habitats. <clears throat> so uh, again, so these are some of the data that I was able to use for my dissertation. Um, first, I again, I was interested in how uh, the processes of macroalgal establishment and persistence occurred. So just taking a look um, here at the percent cover of macroalgae, total macroalgae on the island, each colored line represents a different site around the island. And all I want you to get from this is that at some sites, you can see an increase, what appears to be an increase in macroalgae, um, and at some sites you don't. So this is kind of dealing with the question earlier about, you know, is there one thing that's happening to the Great Barrier Reef? It maybe not. It appears that there can be some patchiness. There can be some areas where you see macroalgae getting a hold, in some areas it doesn't appear to be changing, and there could be a variety of reasons for that. Um, but the cool thing here is that looking at the percent cover of this macroalgae, mm -hmm. um, it's mainly composed of one type of macroalgae in particular, Turbinaria ornata. And so that was the um, focus, going to be the focus of my study, this dominant species of macroalgae. So again, uh, this is my focal study species, Turbinaria. It's um, the most dominant macroalga on, uh, within the back reef habitats. Um, you can see it grows, uh, it's mainly found within the lagoon, but you can see it growing on the reef crest and it actually can withstand being exposed to air 
um, kind of tidally. Um, and it's really cool because, <coughs> excuse me, we have this patchy distribution. So some areas where you think it would be perfectly happy growing, you find it. In other areas, the same, you know, external conditions, you don't find it. So um, it appears that there's other um, processes kind of governing the abundance and distribution of this species. Would they be considered as invasive species? Good question. Um, the invasive species is actually really hard to define because you have to set a time point and it kind of has a, a subjectivity to it. Um, it's like invasive considering, you know, what time frame, like how long ago did it arrive? Invasive considering, you know, is it native to a larger region? So this species um, is not considered, it's technically not considered invasive. Um, it's found in the, within the Central and Western Pacific, but it is relatively new to French Polynesia. So uh, not clear whether they would consider it invasive or not. Okay, so for this talk, I want to focus on two main questions, which I told you guys earlier were the two kind of outstanding questions in the literature. So the first one is what processes maintain a particular phase? So I'm looking at what processes maintain a macroalgal uh, phase. And then how reversible are phase shifts? So once you get to a macroalgal phase, how readily can you reverse it? Okay, so to start with, um, I need to get a little bit more, um, a better understanding of my focal species. So to do that, I wanted to look at some characteristics of Turbinaria ornata that could enable, that could potentially enable the successful um, establishment and persistence of this species. So I looked at um, the life history, demographic traits, um, population dynamics, as well as reinforcing feedbacks that could stabilize this population. So Turbinaria ornata, as I mentioned earlier, is found in the Central and Western Pacific. Um, this is an image of the phalli. So if you guys aren't familiar with the term, the phalli is just the body of the organism. So you could think of it as a, an individual, um, but it's technically not an individual. Uh, but it's, so these are, you know, these are individual phalli. So they're usually growing in lagoon habitats, um, though they can potentially be found on four reef or fridging reef. Um, and they have, both, they have both structural and chemical defenses against the debris. So um, structurally, they have a tough, um, hard um, ballast. So if you were to grab this, it would be really kind of more like a pine cone than you think of as like an algae. It's really um, hardened. And chemically, it contains um, phenolic compounds that deter or debris. Um, we also know that it is uh, re reproductive year-round, um, and it reproduces both sexually and asexually, and it's highly dispersive. It employs two different um, dispersal strategies. One's a local scale, um, so it releases gametes, they fertilize, and then settle out uh, within a meter of the parent phalli. Um, and it also has a longer term, or a longer, larger scale dispersal strategy where um, individuals, these adults, pop off, they senesce, and when they're reproductive and they're old enough, or some signal, they <coughs> pop off and they form, they get together and form these giant mats. So you can see mats like the size of this classroom or even bigger. Um, and once they kind of form that, they're all, it's a big reproductive mat that kind of floats around and can float hundreds of kilometers. And so this is kind of not how they became spread, they spread into uh, French Polynesia. So um, my first step was trying to understand the local <coughs> patterns um, of demographics and dynamics of this species. And to do that, I permanently tagged uh, patches of this species of uh, Turbinaria and followed them for um, a couple years or three years between 2012 and 2015. Um, I wanted to look at the demography, so the relative abundance of um, adults, juveniles, and recruits. I looked at mortality of um, adults and juveniles, I was able to individually tag those phalli. And I also um, looked at, from that mortality, I was able to calculate a half-life and a turnover time um, for these adults and juvenile phalli. <coughs> so the first thing to note uh, demographically <laughs> is that these patches, um, for the whole duration of the study, are generally dominated by recruits. So they, they have a lot more, a higher proportion of immature individuals 
than they do um, adults and juveniles. And that's consistent. Um, there's no seasonal change there for this study. Uh, calculating the um, half-life from the mortality rates, I found that there's about um, a 50-day half-life for, for phthalate. And so you guys remember um, half-life has to do with the exponential de decay. Um, and it's relative, yeah? Oh, I was going to ask about when you were monitoring them, um, did you use a lot of ROVs, or was it more of you diving down and doing the monitoring? It was all me. All <laughs> okay. Yeah, no ROVs in this study. Uh, this is me and uh, a great <coughs> host of um, undergraduate <laughs> field assistants who would come down with us in the summer and we do all this stuff on scuba. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, but if you guys, so half-life, again, is a, a process of exponential decay and it allows you to know kind of at what point you have about 50% of your um, original starting whatever gone. So they use it for um, isotopes, I use it for these um, Terpenary as a way to understand, okay, after about 50 days, about half of the original cohort that I marked remained. And from that, you can also calculate an estimate of turnover time. Um, and so this would be the time where you expect there to be most of the individuals gone, about 1% of would be remaining. And so that would let you know, okay, at, at this point, there's almost a complete turnover of individuals. And this is within a year. Um, so this is pretty fast for, uh, for this species. For, for macroalgae. Um, as far as, as the dynamics, um, I want to show you here, this is the um, a frequency distribution for the patch sizes. Um, so these are the ones that were, this is the distribution of all the patches um, at all the sites in 2013. And you can see that they're mostly uh, less than a tenth of a meter squared. I was able to follow the extinction rates um, of these patches and found that an annual extinction rate ranged between four and seven percent for these patches. So that's pretty low. Um, oops. And the mean size of those extinct patches was um, relatively small compared to the uh, average, or sorry, the distribution. So they were all, um, the mean size was less than uh, 0.01, so that's in the smallest bit. So when patches went extinct, they tended to be pretty small. Uh, colonization rate that I uh, estimated um, was about 14 to 33%. So um, looking at comparing the colonization to the extinction rate, um, it appears that we are witnessing expansion of this uh, macroalgae. So um, just say, just straightforward, the um, colonization rates are greater than the extinction rates here. Um, so the the patches uh, appear to be expanding. Um, how could that be occurring? Uh, so they could be occurring by increasing the number of individuals. So I don't know how much ecology you guys have had. It's, we don't have to get into too much detail here, but I calculated the lambda, which is um, population growth, geometric growth. Um, and that is a <coughs> you know, ratio of the new individuals to the original individuals. So for both years, um, you do that annually. So for both years of the study, um, there was a lambda that was greater than one, which suggests that the populations are growing. There's more individuals. If you have a lambda greater than one, that suggests population growth. A lambda equal to zero means that there's no change. It would be the same individuals um, there from one year to the next. And a lambda next less than zero would indicate decline. So we're seeing a positive increase over time. Um, also seeing that the size of the patches appears to be increasing. So these patches are growing in the number of individuals and they are getting larger in footprint. Um, so that necessarily means that there would be, you would expect a decline in the density. So if you're getting more individuals, um, but, there's, but the amount of space is also getting bigger, is, it, is the amount of space uh, compensating for that increase in individuals? And it appears that yes, it is. Um, you're seeing a decline in the density of these patches over time. So um, another thing that I did that I wanted to look for was whether there was evidence for density dependence. And I'm not sure if you guys have talked about that yet, um, but density dependence is a, is a process that is, um, has been studied in ecology since the very beginning of the field. And it's really relating to um, the consequences of being in a group of individuals. So 
Um, generally, the, the main form of density dependence is direct density dependence, which is a negative relationship between the number of individuals um, and the change in the, or the growth of, the, of that population. So um, the idea being that there's consequences in terms of competition for having a lot of individuals around you. So I wanted to look for that, uh, see if that was present in this population. Um, so I plotted the uh, density of adults, of individuals in one year, by the change in the density between one year to the next. So that would be an estimate of that growth. Um, and I found that there were negative relationships for both, year, both years. And so this was um, supported the idea that there was negative, uh, sorry, direct density dependence going on. Um, and that this would be a negative feedback. So remember earlier I said um, positive feedbacks can reinforce and stabilize populations. Negative feedbacks would destabilize populations. So if there's a lot of competition going on, um, this could lead to um, death of the organisms, or it could lead, if they're mobile, they could end up leaving. Um, either way, it could destabilize the, the local population. So um, this appears to be evidence that there is at least some destabilizing processes occurring. Um, and that would be thinning of these adult phalli in the patches. Uh, but I do want to point out that even though there's, uh, there appears to be a uh, density dependent effect, we still see um, the patches are pretty dense. So um, it appears to be that these, this density dependence is occurring, but it's not necessarily limiting the size of the patches. So for my original question, uh, the first question, what processes maintain a phase? Um, so for turbinaria, uh, year-round presence of immature individuals appear, it seems to be really important. Um, always having kind of a, a seed bank ready to grow um, so that these individuals are always present. Um, we have the patch colonization rates were greater than the extinction rates, and we also saw evidence of um, patch growth in the form of there were more individuals, so lambda was greater than one, and we also saw an increase in the patch area. So again, um, we saw evidence for density <coughs> dependence, but given the, uh, the rest of these characteristics, density dependence doesn't appear to be um, limiting <coughs> this population. So that suggests that there's other mechanisms that are counterbalancing the negative effect of density dependence. And so that pushed me towards the next step uh, which is what are those processes that could um, counter the negative effects of being in association in these patches. So my next part is looking at those stabilizing feedbacks that could promote macroalgal uh, persistence. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, turbine area has uh, both chemical and structural defense, so they have that um, the phenolic compounds that deter herbivores and they also have a tough uh, phallus to also deter herbivores. And I also mentioned that they have local dispersal strategies. So the recruits um, settle within a meter of the parent phalli. And so we saw in the patches that I showed you earlier, lots of recruits um, in these patches with adults and juveniles. And so this led me to wonder whether you could see an associational refuge, um, which would be a benefit for the recruits associated with adults. So um, if you guys haven't heard that term, it's another one in ecology. Um, kind of ecology started out looking at a lot of negative effects of, of association, so competition, predation, and um, I think in the 80s and 90s there's kind of a renaissance in looking at you know these positive effects. And associational refuge is one of those where um, being in an association was thought to be negative because you have all this competition, but uh, there were a number of examples proposed to show that you might have a benefit also by being in association. Um, and so this is one of the ideas that I wanted to test using this population because I knew you had a lot of recruits around these adults and I wondered if there was a benefit for being there. This could be a stabilizing feedback that would um, reinforce this population. Okay, so self-reinforcement in turbine area. First question, um, are there differences in the consumption of turbine area that vary across the different stages? Um, so that would be the first step to figure that out. And secondly, um, <coughs> would associational refuge be a mechanism for reinforcement of turbine area populations? 
Okay, so are there differences in consumption among life stages? So here's a graph of our schematic of how I'm thinking about this. Um, on the left, we have recruits, which are the smallest individuals. Um, they're less than uh, two centimeters, generally, and they are soft. Um, so if you held them, uh, they would be <coughs> much more uh, flexible in your hand. Um, and they have low phenolic content. Content. So again, those phenols are the compounds that deter herbivores, and so they have a relatively low content uh, of those of those concentration of those compounds. And then you move up through juveniles; they get bigger, they get tougher, and then move up to adults, which have the uh, tough phallus like I mentioned, the pine cone brittle um, aspect, and then they have a higher phenolic content. So this was already known going into my PhD. So this allowed me to formulate the idea of. Um, that I want to test, which is, do you see a decline in consumption uh, of, this, um, of these individuals as you increase in size and age? Because um, a mechanism for this would be that there's less um, herbivore deterrent for the smaller ones, and it increases as they get larger. So again, so my hypothesis was that the survival of turbinaria individuals um, increased with size and age, as I showed you earlier. Um, to test that, I set up a field experiment in the, in, uh, the lagoon. So this was a short-term um, experiment where I set up um, individuals of each of these size classes. So I had five size classes, um, and I set them out, and some of them were exposed to herbivory, and some of them were caged to prevent herbivores from accessing them. And the cage was um, a control so that I could see whether there was any handling effect of me you know, gathering them and attaching them to the various substrates, see if there was mortality just from doing that. So there wasn't. Um, so I'm only going to show you what happened with the ones that were exposed to herbivores. So these are the results from that experiment. Um, looking at the x-axis, I have each of the size classes. And the y-axis is the proportion of individuals in that size class that survived. Um, for the study, and this is the average. So there was a significant difference, um, and it depended on, in the survival of these individuals, it depended on the size class. Size classes one and two, which are the smallest ones, size class one and two are less than two centimeters in height, um, had a significantly lower survival rate, or survival proportion, compared to the larger size classes. So this appears to be evidence that um, there's more consumption of these uh, turbinary individuals when they're smaller, and there appears to be kind of a threshold after which um, the survival is not impacted by herbivory. So are there differences in consumption by herbivores among turbinary life stages? Um, yes, it appears that survival increases when, uh, with size when exposed to herbivores. Okay, so that kind of sets up the first part of my associational refuge hypothesis. Now I want to know, is associational refuge for recruits um, associated with adults, could that be a mechanism for replenishment and reinforcement of turbinaria populations? So if we have a recruits that are more vulnerable, they have a, a lower survival when exposed to herbivory than adults, if we have a lot of those associated with the adults, um, could there be a benefit for those recruits being associated with that, um, those other um, individuals that are less palatable, so less um, likely to be consumed by herbivores? So the hypothesis I wanted to test, um, is survival higher for recruits associated with adults? And does the magnitude of this effect depend on the density of those adults? So I set up um, a field experiment at a site where I knew there was lots of herbivory. So herbivory is the eating of algae. And I set up this site, at a, this experiment at a site where I had previously done lots of assays, um, putting out algae and uh, recording how much was lost. And I knew that lots of macroalgae is consumed at this site. So I set up the experiment um, and I had uh, looked at the survival of recruits associated in four adult densities. So no adults, which allowed me to see what the survival of recruits would be um, just on their own, and then increasing all the way up to 200 adults per meter squared, uh, which is within the range uh, that I saw for those patches um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I did this 
um, where I had cages that would prevent herbivore access, so that would be an herbivore exclusion treatment. Um, and I also looked at when herbivores were allowed access, so um, set this up in a fully factorial design where I had all uh, combinations of all of these treatments, of all eight treatments. So here are the results from that experiment. Um, this is a short term, seven days. So on the x-axis, I have each of the adult density treatments. No adults, low, intermediate, and high. And then on the y-axis, I have the proportion of surviving recruits. And so we're first just looking at when herbivores were present. These were um, accessible to herbivores, the open um, squares. And so what you see here is there's a significant um, difference in the survival of the recruits depending on which treatment you're in. The survival was much lower when there were left fewer adults, and the survival increased as the density of adults increased. Compare that to when, uh, when the herbivores were not present, and you see that when herbivores were, were not present, the survival was relatively high. So the survival of the recruits appears to be really um, driven by herbivory, um, but the key thing is that there's an interaction between the, um, the herbivore treatment and the adult density treatment. And the way to really drive this home is to look at um, the differences between these two treatments. So again, the white, the, sorry, the open squares are when herbivores had access and the closed squares are when herbivores were excluded. And you can see when the herbivores were um, in this treatment, there's a large effect of herbivores. So when you have herbivores, um, and you have recruits by themselves, they get consumed, and the survival is significantly reduced. Compare that to when you have a high density of adults. If you compare those two, um, those two values, there's, really, there's no significant difference between those two boxes. So there's no, the effect of herbivores is um, eliminated, basically, when you have this high density of adults. So this is evidence in support of the idea that there's an associational benefit for the recruits um, that are with adults. So um, the next step of this, this associational refuge idea is the concept that um, there's two parts of an associational interaction. There's a positive and there's a negative. So there's a benefit and a cost. Um, you can't be, there's always going to be some sort of competitive interaction going on. Um, but in what I showed you earlier, it appeared that the benefit of that association outweighed the cost. So I wanted to know what is the cost of this association? Is there a cost? And in what circumstances does the cost outweigh the benefit? So to test that, I thought about um, kind of the theory behind the relative importance of benefits versus cost, which is that. Um, it's beneficial to be in association when there's a lot of outlying stress, when the stress is high um, in the area. So in this case, the stress is in the form of herbivory. If there's a lot of herbivore pressure, then recruits would do much better with being with adults, even if they're having to deal with competition. So the competitive um, interactions between adults and recruits could be shading. They could be, since the adults are taller, they could be shading out, blocking some light for them. They could be um, competing with them <coughs> for um, any of the things that they're pulling in from the water column. Um, they could be abrading them by being above them and you know, as the uh, currents flow, they could scrape them. So there's actually quite a, there's a number of different negative uh, things that could be happening when they're in this association. So my hypothesis was that um, the relative cost versus benefit really depends on the amount of stress, so the amount of herbivory. To test that, I wanted to set up a longer term um, study. So this was a five week experiment because I, I reasoned that some of these costs versus benefits would be longer scale than um, just a seven day study that would have to do with growth and things like that. So I extended this experiment. I set it up at a low herbivory site. So I had done assays here, determined that there was less, much less um, consumption of macroalgae. And so I set up a field experiment where I had two treatments. Um, one where I removed all of the adults and juveniles. Again, those were the ones that are relatively not consumed by herbivores, so they're relatively in unpalatable. I left the recruits there. And then the other treatment, I left all the adults, juveniles, and recruits, and I marked all of those adults and juveniles so I could see what was present at the beginning of the experiment. I counted the recruits um, in, at the initial point, and then at the end, I looked, my metric was net production, 
Um, and that really, I don't have to go into too much detail, but that really just incorporates the fact that some of the recruits grew into new juveniles at that point, at the end of the study, and some of them stayed recruits, and some of them probably died. So this is a, a metric to incorporate all of that that's happening. Um, so do the differences in the effect of herbivores um, depend on the uh, local stress? So this is the, these are the data from the end of that experiment, the five weeks. So I have the control treatment, where again, I didn't remove anything. And then the uh, removal treatment, where I took out all the um, invulnerable, the adults and juveniles. And these, uh, this is the net production. So the first thing to note is that it's all above zero. It's all positive. So they were growing, regardless of whether it was the control or the adult removal treatment. But the key thing is, the difference between those two points is about twofold. So if you had the adults and juveniles removed and you were a recruit, you grew two times better than if you had adults and juveniles with you. And that is evidence that there's a negative effect of the adults and juveniles, some competitive effect. There's some, you know, there's some negative um, thing going on between adults and juveniles and recruits. So this is evidence that there's, there is a cost to this association. So back to the key questions, what processes maintain a particular phase? Um, it looks like intraspecific, so within species, uh, associational refuge provides a reinforcing feedback so that turban area populations can persist. If you have recruits that are protected when they're vulnerable by being with adults, they can grow out of that vulnerable phase, um, then grow into new adults and juveniles to provide a benefit for new recruits, and that population can persist. Um, also, the benefit versus the cost seems to depend on um, the local herbivore stress. So when I did this um, experiment in an area where there's lots of herbivory, we saw that the benefit was the main effect, was the net effect. And when I did it in an area where there was lower herbivory, saw that there was um, the cost came out as the net effect. So this really suggests that um, once populations become populations of turban area become established in a high herbivory environment, uh, this mechanism, the associational refuge, can be a reinforcing mechanism that allows it to persist even when there's lots of herbivory in the area. Any questions on the first part? That's kind of the first question. Okay. So the second part um, of the talk is the how reversible are phase shifts? So again, this goes back to the idea of when you have transitioned <coughs> to a state or phase that's dominated by macroalgae, how readily, how easily can you reverse um, so that you can get back to the coral state? Okay, so I studied the, effect, the, the effects of herbivores on macroalgae communities. Okay, so turban area associated um, macroalgae communities uh, may be difficult to remove. And that's kind of the, the guiding process of this portion. Um, we see that once macroalgal phase shifts become established, they appear to be persistent. And one of the ideas is that, is, could this be because once they establish, they are difficult to remove. They, um, we saw that t associational refuge in turban area is both intraspecific we also know that it has interspecific associational refuge. So turban area, the algae, provides a refuge for other types of macroalgae in Morea specifically. So here's an example of that. This is turban area on the outside of this image, and the arrow is pointing at Sargassum pacificum, which is another type of macroalgae. And when you are in Morea, you only find Sargassum pacificum within these associations of turban area. Um, if you, it, it's much more palatable, um, it's much tastier than turban area, so anywhere else it would get consumed. So you really only find it in refuges. Um, and so study, um, other work has looked at the ability of turban area to provide a <coughs> refuge for other species and found that um, there's, it enhances diversity, local diversity, by being there. So um, this is another sort of... Um, piece of evidence that, that leads us to think that um, you, once you have uh, macroalgae and these reinforcing mechanisms can allow lots of different types of macroalgae to persist. And that may be difficult to remove once established if you have 
Um, lots of, you know, the tasty macroalgae that would be readily consumed is protected from being consumed. So if you have this um, coral, sorry, the macroalgal dominated reef, um, we know that when transitioning back to coral is relatively difficult, as I mentioned, we have um, the, the presence of macroalgae can actually inhibit the settlement of new corals. And then also, as we're learning, um, we have reinforcing feedbacks like the associational refuge that can keep the macroalgal state in, uh, persistent. So um, we also know that herbivores are really important in the prevention of macroalgal establishment. So this is a picture of a parrotfish, which is um, a herbivore that consumes that turf algae. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's really important to maintain that turf algae because coral can actually settle on it. So we know that, re that herbivores are really important in their, um, as they eat around on the reef, they keep it closely cropped and they can prevent macroalgal establishment and thus promote this recovery to the coral reef. <clears throat> so this is gonna get into a little bit of theory. So if you guys want to have me explain it differently, just feel free to stop. But the idea here um, is that we have a pretty good, you know, coral reef ecologists in general have a pretty good understanding of the ability for herbivores to prevent macroalgal establishment. So I'm showing you a graph here this is like a, a heuristic, so it's a way to think about it. It's not real data, but it's just a relationship that we might expect based on um, the hypothesis that herbivores can readily prevent macroalgal establishment. So if you're thinking about preventing macroalgal establishment, uh, when you're preventing it, you're in a situation where it's low and you're trying to keep it low, right? So we're starting over here on the graph where macroalgae is low. So sorry, the y-axis is macroalgae. Cover, percent cover, biomass, doesn't matter. It's just a metric of how much macroalgae there is. So we're over here where it's low. And at this point, herbivory is high. So again, these, these parrotfish are swimming around. They're keeping the reef closely cropped. They're preventing any of the macroalgae from establishing, from settling and, and establishing. So. Um, this graph is really asking or showing how low can you go, how low can you reduce herbivory before the herbivores are unable to prevent the establishment of macroalgae and the amount of macroalgae shoots up. And that's pretty well known that herbivore, that the relationship between macroalgae and herbivory looks like this for, for uh, thinking about the prevention of macroalgal establishment. But we don't actually have a great idea of what it looks like when uh, macroalgae needs to be removed. So um, what is the relationship between macroalgae and herbivory when you're talking about removing it? So if you're talking about removing it, you're starting at a different state. At this point, you have lots of macroalgae and you need to know how much herbivory, how much do you need to increase herbivory to remove it? So we're starting over here, where herbivory is low, macroalgae is high, and we're increasing herbivory, increasing, increasing until some point where they're able to consume it and the amount of macroalgae drops. And so what you can see here is that these two relationships are theoretically, uh, appear to be different based on the hypotheses that I've talked about. Um, and this leads to this idea that there could be two potential states. I won't get into the weeds on, on the theory here because lots of people like to fight about it, I don't. <laughs> um, so the main point is just, to, if you look at this, um, that it's really apparent, without getting into too much of the detail, that at the same level of herbivory, you could have two different macroalgal states. You could have low macroalgae, or you could have high macroalgae. And it depends on where you started. So if you started with the blue line, where you started in a prevention state, you might have low macroalgae. And if you started in the red line, where you started with lots of macroalgae that need to be removed, you might be on the high line, at that same level of herbivory. So this is, my question is how effective are herbivores in the prevention of macroalgae versus the removal of macroalgae? So again, does it, so even in more simple, simpler terms, um, does it take the same amount of macroalgae to the prevent the establishment as it does to remove macroalgae that's already been established? So again, if you're here and you have this turf um, community where you need to know how much macro, how much herbivory is required to prevent establishment, how low can you go um, before you switch into being dominated by macroalgae, and if you're over here and you want to know, uh, you have a lot of macroalgae, 
how you want to know how much herbivory does it take to remove it. So you're sliding along here until at what point do you end up with the macroalgae removed and you end up in that phase. And the key thing is, are those the same? Do you need the same amount of macroalgae to do both of those, or sorry, same amount of herbivory to do both of those things? So to ask to test this question, um, we set up a field experiment. This was um, had the help of lots of different undergrads. Um, a bunch of us were required to do this. It was a, a bit, pretty big undertaking. We were setting up an experiment in the lagoon um, where we set out, we wanted to have two different initial conditions, like I mentioned. One that would be a represent a turf community and one that would represent a mature macroalgae community. And then we wanted to vary the herbivore access, which we did using cages. So the first question, how much herbivory is required to prevent the establishment of macroalgae? Um, we set up these tiles. Uh, they are terracotta tiles, um, which you can see in this image. That's a, a couple of them, sorry, right here. Um, we set tiles into, put them in these cages. Um, and the cages, we cut different size holes, different numbers and sizes of holes in them to control the size and number of herbivorous fish that could access them. Because what we want you to do is create um, that x-axis of a, a gradient or differences in herbivory. And the way we chose to do that was changing the hole size um, with the idea that if you had a smaller hole size, fewer and smaller fish would be able to access it. You would increase the hole sizes and the space available all the way up to fully accessible, which would represent the ambient or the highest level of herbivory. We did a similar setup to look at the, um, to the second part of that question, which is how much herbivory is required to remove macroalgae. So these tiles, we outplanted turbinaria onto them. So we went out in the reef, we used a hammer and chisel to chisel off pieces of the substrate with the algae attached. Then we used a marine epoxy to attach it to those terracotta tiles. And we put those in the cages with the same sort of hole design. So that we now we have um, we have the ability to recreate that graph that I showed you earlier. So the first question we wanted to know was: Did the cages create uh, differences in herbivory? Um, so we did this separately from the experiment. We took each of those cages with the different hole uh, designs, and we I put in um, a really tasty type of macroalgae and a really tasty type of turf, turf algae. And I baited all of those cages with, the, with these, and we used GoPros um, underwater to record um, herbivory in these different cage treatments. And so we did this for six days and ended up with about 20 hours of video, which took about uh, <laughs> two years to watch <laughs> and actually <coughs> record everything that's going on. Um, it's a really cool tool, uh, but it does make a ton of work. So. Keep that in mind if you ever think if someone ever says, hey, that'd be a great thing to video. Um, so at the end of that, we had, we had all of this data so we could see whether there are differences in the consumption or the herbivory in all the different treatments. And so the first thing on the top is we have a metric for herbivory, which is the um, biomass weighted foraging time. So this is um, for the fish that were inside of the cage consuming either type of algae. How much time did they spend doing that also um, accounting for the size of the fish, with the idea that a tiny fish spending a ton of time is very different from a really big fish spending uh, less time. So we wanted to kind of standardize that by um, incorporating the biomass into this foraging time. And what you can see here is that it's not a really clean gradient. It's really more, there's lots of herbivory, not a lot, and then none. Um, and that was, seems to be driven by the biomass of the fish that were able to enter these cages. So um, on the x-axis here, this is the smallest hole size all the way up to the ambient. And you can see there's an increase in the uh, biomass of the fish that are able to access these treatments. Okay, so back to our original question, how much of injury is required to prevent versus remove uh, macroalgae? So this is the, these are the data after two years. So we have um, on the y-axis the final macroalgal biomass that we collected off of all the tiles at the end of the experiment. And on the 
x-axis, I'm going to have all the different herbivore treatments going from no herbivory, so that was a small soil size where we saw nobody enter, no, no herbivory happening, all the way up to ambient, which were fully accessible. So the first line to look at is the herbivore uh, ability to prevent uh, macroalgal establishment. So here we have the, um, these are the tiles that initially started with turf. So the first thing to notice is that well below ambient, uh, levels of herbivory are required to have any macroalgae at all. So it seems like you can reduce um, the herbivory well below ambient before you start to see a <coughs> shift to macroalgal establishment. Um, compare that to when we first started with turban area. So the first thing to show is that there's order magnitude difference in the amount of, of macroalgal biomass present on these tiles. And um, what you see here is that even if you start out with lots of uh, macroalgae, you, redu you have to reduce it, reduce, sorry, increase the river quite a bit until you see um, a reduction in the amount of macroalgae. And even there, there's still some macroalgae present. Um, this is a significant interaction, so it's saying that there's um, the effect of the cave, sorry, the effect of the herbivore treatment depends on whether you started out as turf or macroalgae. And what you see here is that there may be the potential for two different states, um, as I mentioned earlier. So at the same level of herbivory, um, you can have you know, very close or about zero uh, grams of macroalgae, or you can have uh, upwards of 50 grams of macroalgae. And that can depend on uh, the initial condition. So at that same level of herbivory, you have two different potential um, outcomes. Um, and the cool thing about this experiment is that we were able to pick up patterns that were present in the, um, that we see out in the field. So um, these are just showing you at that end of the experiment, we collected all the macroalgae on these tiles and we looked at um, some metrics of the diversity of these tiles as well. So on the x-axis we have the uh, macroalgae biomass and, sorry, the y-axis macroalgae biomass, x-axis is herbivory. Um, and what I'm showing here is that turban area was the thing that we outplanted initially. So that was the only thing on these tiles at the beginning of the experiment. These are the tiles that started out with turban area. At the end, we see more, uh, more different types of macroalgae, um, showing that what I showed you earlier, this, that turban area can provide a refuge for other types of macroalgae. Because you see, when the herbivory is high, you don't see a lot of these um, other species of macroalgae. But when the herbivory is reduced, you do see turban area providing this refuge. And even when the herbivory is a little bit um, less than ambient, you still see this refuge occurring. Does it mean it's a really productive system? Um, it, from this, not necessarily. Um, just from other pieces of knowledge, we do know that uh, coral reefs have relatively high productivity. Um, but from this, this is really just showing that um, <clears throat> if you reduce herbivory, even here there's some other species found within the turban area, but if you, as you keep reducing herbivory, so reducing that external stress, more and more species are able to get a refuge um, with turban area. But also remember this is biomass, not productivity. Productivity would be over time, so this is just at the end of our experiment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we also saw that the time. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, no problem. What is um, reducing the memory like entail? Oh, that is. Yeah. So that's just like removing animals that eat all the plants. Or? That's actually just the whole sizes. Uh -huh. So these have these are totally open. So you can imagine it. It's just like a buff, like a plate, uh -huh. just with these tiles on it, and then. Bees have more cage with more holes, uh, okay. and the holes get smaller and smaller. So uh, again, that's that's the reducing the herbivory. It's uh, just right. allowing fewer and fewer um, fish and then smaller fish to access it. Gotcha. Yeah. I uh, also saw that the tiles reflected the reef community. So I'm not going to go into too many details about how this plot was created. Just know it is a um, multi-dimensional technique where you can look at the similarities within communities for multiple variables. Um, and these are just looking at all the tiles that started out with turban area. Um, and all I want you guys to notice is that the, there was a clustering that happened and it, it was driven by um, 
the hot beer memory treatment. So up there, the, the tiles that were up there are more similar, um, and they were the higher memory treatments. And down here, on this, in this direction, these are the lower memory treatments, which are more similar. Um, and the higher memory treatments were dominated by two types of brown um, macroalgae, Dictyota and Turbinaria. Um, and these, these species are found pretty much widespread throughout the lagoons. You can find them um, on flat substrates, on top of um, coral bombies, on, uh, you know, with just basically they're exposed. And so this suggests that they can withstand um, the higher herbivory and the exposed surfaces. Um, compare that to the lower herbivory treatments. So again, these are the ones with the smallest hole size that were more protected from herbivory. Those tended to be dominated by these two, um, Amantia rhodontha and Halomita. This is Amantia and Halomita. And those species are much more um, palatable to herbivores. And so you really only find them in cracks and crevices on the reef. So you actually only find them in low herbivory environments on the reef. So this is just more evidence that this experiment was actually capturing um, real you know, dynamics that are occurring on the reef. Okay, so back to the key questions. What processes maintain a particular phase? <coughs> Positive feedbacks, so um, mechanisms like associational refuge seem to be able to maintain and provide this reinforcement mechanism to maintain uh, turbine area and macroalgal populations. And then the second question, how reversible are phase shifts? Um, it appears that more herbivory is required to remove macroalgae than is required to prevent the establishment. So this really highlights that there's, <coughs> there's significant differences in the ability of the herbivore community to function, and it depends on the state of the reef. So consequences, um, and different ways of thinking about that, um, I mentioned this, I sort of alluded to this earlier, but um, the herbivory community is not just monolithic. Um, it's actually formed of different functional groups that have different purposes. So for um, studying, for thinking about macroalgae, two key groups are important. The grazers, um, which are, for example, this, these parrotfish. This is a great shot of the parrotfish um, doing what I was talking about earlier, which is cropping the, um, keeping that substrate crop that's, crop, that's turf that it's consuming. Those guys consume the turf, and while they're doing that, they consume the tiny microscopic young stages of macroalgae. So they're kind of indiscriminately keeping the substrate clean. And the other type of functional group that's really important are the browsers. And the browsers are the only group that have the ability to consume uh, mature macroalgae. So this is actually a screen grab from one of my GoPro videos uh, where I put out this assay of sargassum. And you see this is a unicorn fish, and it's um, pulling the algae off and eating it. And so there's really only a few species that are able to perform this role. So this is where uh, my research um, gets kind of into the applied realm, which is what I'm interested in, is what are the implications of this research for uh, conservation and management. So in Berea specifically, we know that there are much more grazers than there are browsers, um, just in terms of numbers of fish, but also in terms of species. There's about um, 30 or so species of grazers versus two to four species of browsers. Um, we also know that the browsers are heavily targeted as part of local fishery. So these are pictures of the unicorn fish on a plate. Um, that's a picture actually from Maria where you've got fish um, lined up um, every night. They go out and do the hunting for these guys or um, dawn or dusk, and then they hang them out on the side of the road so you can go buy them during the day. Um, they also are hunting uh, fishing for the parrotfish and other grazers, but this is having a, it appears to be having a disproportionate effect on the browsers because there's already a uh, relatively restricted ability for the browsers uh, because there's so few, relatively few of them, that this, the impact of this fishing um, is having a disproportionate effect. So <clears throat> we know that the browsers are really the key part of this story here because um, more herbivory is required to remove macroalgae uh, than to prevent the establishment in Berea, and this could be because of the relatively low um, abundance of these browser populations. So this has really consequences for um, management because if you have a reef that is transitioning to macroalgal establishment, you really need to be thinking about 
conservation and management of this these particular functional groups, so these unicorn fish. And that is really um, kind of gets a tangled issue because this is a part of a subsistence uh, and artisanal fishery, traditional uh, fishery. So how do you work out the conservation of this reef and also dealing with the different um, goals and desires of the different stakeholders. The one good thing about the story, or one of the good things about the story, is that um, the fishermen in Morea are really are really committed to preserving these resources. So there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of, um, of thoughts about how to work through this, how to conserve, how to protect the reef so that they can, so the reef can recover and they can continue to use these resources for years to come. Um, with that, I will end, and um, I'll take any questions that you guys have. Thanks for being a great audience. <laughs>
Ask a question or two while we uh, while we pack up. You guys are more than welcome to.